Good evening. Welcome to today's webinar on varicose veins by Benton Hospital. I'm your host and my name is Louise King. Um, today's presenters are Mr. Ellie Eddie Chandler and Mr. Aaron Sweeney, they're consultant vascular surgeons at Benton Hospital. The presentation will last approximately 30 minutes, followed by a Q&A session. The Q&A session will be uh, at a point where you can ask questions at the bottom of the screen via the Q&A icon. If you could try and use this icon versus the chat icon, that'd be perfect. Um, we will ask answer as many questions as possible, and any that we can't answer in the session, we will do so via email afterwards. Um, you can ask the questions using your name, um, or you can tick a box to say you want to be anonymous. Um, please note that this session is being recorded as well. Um, and finally, after this session, we will have our private patient line open from 7 p.m. if you wanted to book any consultations. We have Karen and Emma on the line to speak to you. So I'll now hand over to Mr. Eddie Chandler. Thank you, Eddie. Uh, thanks very much, Louise, and thanks everybody for joining uh, the webinar tonight. Um, I, I'm obviously on the left-hand side of the screen, and uh, Aaron, my colleague on the right. We've been uh, doing the varicose vein service at Benenden now for over 10 years, so uh, we're, uh, we're pretty well established um, down at Benenden. And indeed, we've been doing uh, varicose vein surgery for considerably longer than that. Um, we were the first surgeons in London and the Southeast to use the endovenous laser technique uh, for varicose veins back in 2002-2003. And uh, this has really changed the way uh, treatment for this very common condition is delivered uh, and improved it beyond uh, all recognition. When uh, Aaron and I were young surgeons training, we learned how to do an operation called a high time strip. And that was the only operation for varicose veins there was for about a hundred years. And it's involved uh, always putting patients to sleep and making big holes in the skin in order to do the operation. And it took around about six weeks for people to get better from that procedure. Um, but with the advent of minimally invasive techniques uh, to treat varicose veins, uh, we can do most of our work under local anaesthetic. We don't have to put people to sleep. Um, and most people get back better within a couple of weeks. Uh, we've got a lot of experience with this. We've probably done more varicose veins than any other uh, surgical practice in the entire country uh, over the last 20 years. Uh, and uh, yeah, that's just Darren and what I've just said. Uh, Virtually all varicose veins these days can be fixed with minimally invasive treatment. Now, people often wonder what minimally invasive means. Well, it doesn't mean non-invasive. In other words, it's not a magic wand. We do have to uh, put things inside the body in order to achieve the effect. But the difference between minimally invasive surgery and what one might call standard or open surgery, uh, I prefer the term old fashioned, but uh, some people might argue with that. Uh, the difference is that we make very much smaller incisions. In fact, the incision we need to make uh, to insert the laser is around about two or three millimeters. So you can barely see it even after we've finished. And the essence of minimally invasive treatment, the sort of practical philosophy behind it, is to give the same result as you would with standard open surgery, but to do it without causing what might be termed collateral damage to surrounding structures or making very big incisions in the skin. And uh, there's no doubt that, that minimally invasive surgery, not just in varicose, for varicose veins, but for um, taking out gallbladders or appendixes or colons, has really become very well established as the treatment of choice in, in virtually uh, specialties. And as I mentioned previously, around 90% of cases can be formed under, under local anaesthetic. So it's really a bit like going to the dentist in some respects. Now, when I say local anaesthetic, I don't mean to imply, as you may see on some uh, somewhat misleading adverts on the internet, that this technique is painless, because it isn't. Uh, in order to deliver the local anaesthetic, we do have to 
do some injections in the leg um, in the same way that the dentist has to do some injections in your mouth. And that hurts a bit, um, but for most people, they find it quite tolerable. There are some patients who uh, are very nervous about local anaesthetic injections, as, as there are uh, when people go to the dentist. And for those patients, we can give a sedative of a, a tablet of our operation. We usually use a tablet called Tamazepam, which is a very well established uh, uh, tranquilizer type uh, medication um, and normally we find that if people are very nervous about injections that solves the problem it makes them more relaxed and they find that the procedure really is quite quite tolerable occasionally we do give patients a general anesthetic but that's very rare uh, it's probably about about two or three percent of cases and it's usually either because patients choose that because uh, there really are uh, some patients who are just very, very needle phobic and they're frightened of the laser procedure. And if, you, if patients want to have general anaesthetic, there's no problem with doing that. Uh, and very occasionally, there are cases where we actually technically can't do it uh, with the minimally invasive or with the under local anaesthetic, rather, but, and we need to have a general anaesthetic. But that's, that's really very uncommon. Uh, at Benenden, we do somewhere around uh, seven to 800 uh, cases per year. Um, and that's about, cases for about half of our total practice. Um, and that's the, uh, the biggest um, volume uh, vein centre, uh, certainly in the southeast, probably in the whole of England. Um, now, people wonder what are varicose veins? Well, because they're, they're extremely common. And, and broadly speaking, this is all about the way the blood flows in your leg. There are two sorts of uh, blood vessel in the leg. There are the arteries, which take blood down to the leg muscles, and the veins, which bring the blood back up the leg. Um, now, you obviously, the, the blood uh, in the arteries is pushed down the leg by the heart, uh, which is essentially a pump, and the blood comes back up the leg uh, by use of the calf muscle. When you contract the calf muscle, it squeezes the veins and pushes the blood back up. But because the calf muscle doesn't contract all the time, you have to have valves in the veins to stop all the blood ending up in your ankles. And varicose veins occur when those valves start to fail and the blood pools in the lower part. Now the patient notices this as swollen purple or blue veins that stick out uh, and are lumpy, bulging or twisted in appearance. And the consequence of the blood pooling in the leg is that the legs tend to ache, they feel heavy and uncomfortable and uh, patients get swollen feet and ankles. And the sensation is often referred to as a cramping or a burning or a throbbing sensation. Usually it have been standing up for one day. And if this goes on for long enough, because the pressure in the veins is too high, it can start to damage the skin uh, over the lower part of the leg, usually around the ankle, because that's the area of highest pressure. And this manifests itself as a, as a darkening of the skin, so sort of dilatation of, of veins in the lower part around your ankle, um, and then a sort of itching and a dryness of the skin uh, and a discoloration. It starts to look brown and, uh, and slightly dry. Uh, now I'm going to hand over to Aaron at this point, and he's going to talk about how we classify veins in order of severity and what that means as far as treatment is concerned. Uh, good. Uh, thanks a lot. Uh, good evening. Um, there are six different grades of uh, varicose vein problems and normally uh, that doesn't really matter to people uh, reading about it, uh, but for, if, uh, most times it's just small veins or big veins. And we start off with the smallest type, which are those that you can see on the surface. and these generally don't cause any uh, medical problem, but can be a little unsightly. And many people uh, find these very irritating. Uh, we can treat those. Uh, we normally treat uh, them with sclerotherapy, which is where I or Eddie will inject a small uh, amount of a chemical, which irritates the uh, vein, causes it to block off, and then it eventually uh, dissolves and disappears. It, uh, sounds quite easy. It is a little technical. It sometimes takes a few treatments to get a very good uh, cosmetic result, 
and it can produce some bruising uh, and skin staining, which looks a little brown in colour, which eventually disappears. Uh, but it is, a, it is a treatment that's very effective, uh, but it does take quite a few weeks to settle down and uh, look good. There are many different treatments for smaller thread veins. And the reason there are many treatments is because no one treatment works perfectly. But we use injection, we use sclerotherapy because we think it's the best. Uh, we have used skin lasers and a machine called a pulse light laser. And they work all reasonably well, but just we found that uh, sclerotherapy was the best. These type of veins are not generally uh, troublesome, although occasionally uh, they can bleed. Next slide, please. Uh, grade two are just a little bit bigger. They're normally veins you can you start to feel. And then they, again, usually don't cause any trouble uh, and are mostly cosmetic, but they can be a little uncomfortable and can produce some itching. Again, we prefer to treat those with sclerotherapy, but sometimes we will do a tiny little incision to remove them. Um, they, again, are again troublesome. Sometimes take a few goes to get a very good cosmetic result. Um, but in general, uh, we get reasonable results with those. The next slide. And this really is what we would call medical veins. These are veins that are enlarged and starting to cause a little bit of trouble. And that trouble can be, as Eddie mentioned, uh, pain, aching, night cramps, skin that becomes itchy, or that awful heavy feeling that you get at the end of the day. These are really the type of veins that insurance companies allow you to have treated. Uh, they generally regard anything smaller uh, as being purely cosmetic. Um, with these veins, there is an option of injection, uh, of injection sclerotherapy, but we prefer not to do that. We think it's not a very effective way of treating them. Uh, and it does produce uh, a lot of discoloration in the skin when you treat large veins with uh, injections. Interestingly, sometimes people can see a small vein uh, or a few veins on the surface and they wonder why would that vein be producing so much discomfort in my leg? And the answer is that all you're seeing is just the tip of the iceberg. Nearly always, just underneath the surface, there is another vein and that can run the entire length of your leg. So it can, in some circumstances, be 60 centimeters long. And it's a little, it's all filled with blood and it's a bit like a yard of ale just sitting under the skin and all you see is the small vein at the surface uh, but the reason you're getting so much pain is that vein is, is in fact quite large you just can't see it so normally when veins start to become uncomfortable they're at least grade three and they're usually the veins we start to um, uh, treat with uh, lasers next slide now grade four is really when people have varicose veins, but they are not really sure if they're causing them any trouble. So quite often people get itchy skin or eczema or start to get some discoloration of the skin. And often they uh, will think it's perhaps just a little bit of eczema and they try various steroid creams. And often this goes on for quite some time. Uh, it can be many years. And Grade four is when the skin starts to become discolored or damaged. And that's often when it becomes scaly or brown uh, in color. And it's really a sign that the vein has gone from being just a, an annoyance to a proper medical problem, because if left untreated, this will almost invariably uh, continue to irritate your skin. And in the worst case scenario, you can end up with bleeding or even an ulcer. Our next pictures are a little bit uh, gruesome because they do show uh, skin that has been damaged and Eddie and I always feel that this is a complete failure because this could have been caught many years before and treated and we feel it is a little depressing when uh, patients come to us and they have an ulcer and they're in dressings and really their life is turned upside down and both of us feel that that could have been stopped many years before, if only uh, they'd realized uh, that it was a varicose vein that was causing all the trouble. So I think we might just show the next slide briefly, uh, just to not turn you off your 
dinners. Uh, but essentially, that's normally doesn't happen after a few months. That's normally years and years. And unfortunately, it nearly always occurs in people who didn't realize that the skin irritation and the skin discoloration was caused by a, a varicose vein. And indeed, if you can stomach looking at those pictures, you'll see that you can't really see any varicose veins nearby. And it is not unusual to have a very large varicose vein that can be 20 or 30 centimeters long and the size of your uh, thumb just sitting under the surface and not really that visible, uh, but allowing blood to pool around your ankle and damage the skin. And then all it requires is a small little knock or a damage in a, by a shopping trolley. All of a sudden you end up with an ulcer. And the average length of time that those ulcers stay is over a year. And to be honest, I don't think you ever recover fully from this. We can treat that. We do usually laser the vein that's causing the problem and we can get rid of the ulcer, but the skin remains scarred, discolored, and it never goes back to being uh, normal again. I think I'm back to, back to you now, Eddie, I think. There we go, that's me again. Um, yeah, thanks, sir. Um, so that, that's a pretty good uh, summary of, of the range of problems we get with veins from the purely cosmetic all the way to uh, the very seriously medical problematic uh, part. And the essence of treatment uh, is really to seal the leaky vein. Um, as Aaron said, the, the visible veins that you can see in the calf are usually the tip of the iceberg and it's the uh, usually what we call a trunk vein uh, or the saphenous vein uh, which is inside the leg and that can't be seen with the naked eye but we can see it with ultrasound, which we use all the time in clinic uh, on every patient that we see. And we can see where the, the, the veins you can see on the surface, where they are actually being filled from. And oftentimes it's the, the long saphenous vein, which runs down the inside of your thigh. And you can see here on the graphic, uh, this hard line just above the knee, it's gone all the way right up to the top and then the, the top part is where it's uh, very, very narrow has been sealed now as the laser is drawn back, back down the thigh. And then eventually the lower part where it's blue will also be sealed. And basically we burn the inside of the vein with the laser. And that sounds like an utterly hideous thing to do to somebody, but it works extremely well. It, it works a lot better than the alternative, uh, which is when we cut people in the top of the leg in the groin and strip the vein out with a big plastic rod. And Aaron and I did hundreds and hundreds of those operations when we were younger surgeons. Um, and uh, th th there's no question that, that uh, everyone's forgotten about what that used to be like, uh, but it was miserable. We used to have patients coming back to clinic with wound infections and, and big bruising and lymphatic leaks in the groin nerve injury, uh, the complication rate is around about 10%. Um, but uh, having got skilled at using the laser, it's uh, very rare to have a serious complication these days. Um, now, a laser is not the only option. There are others, and uh, you will read about them if you do some research around this point. The commonest uh, technique other than a laser is a thing called radio frequency. And um, that, broadly speaking, in, in layman's terms, is pretty much the same thing. Uh, it's the use of heat to damage the vein to get it to seal. And the difference is that, that lasering is heat generated by amplified light, and radio frequency is heat generated by electricity. Um, in practical terms, there's virtually no difference. And then there are the chemical techniques. Sclerotherapy, Aaron has already mentioned, and that is a very good technique uh, done for the right uh, type of vein. Uh, but for bigger veins, Aaron and I don't think that works very well for the reasons we've given it. It makes you lumpy and bruised for a long time. And uh, it also has a very high recurrence rate. Uh, you see the more, the newer techniques, Clary vein, that's a, that's a, a hybrid technique of a, of a chemical and a mechanical uh, technique combined. We, we were the first surgeons in the UK to use that operation. Um, and it does have some very good points, but the problem we found, the reason we stopped doing it uh, as a choice is that it has a high recurrence rate. Uh, around about 20% of patients will get their veins back again within two years of clarivane. 
Whereas with the laser, the, the, the recurrence rate is more like uh, 5%, so one in 20 at five years. And then finally, you may come across the technique called glue, uh, which is glue, it's a simple super glue, basically tissue glue. And, and that has been used, but, uh, and, and again, that can be quite successful, but there are where it's really difficult, really very challenging side effects where patients have had what we call skin necrosis, where the, the uh, skin over the vein is completely broken down and cause an ulcer from the operation. We've, we've never had a problem with that because we've never used it, but, but uh, that has been reported. And, um, and for that reason, we steer away from glue, um, mainly because we think the laser is a very good operation. It's not perfect, but um, it's, it's pretty good. And uh, uh, on balance, we think it's the best technique available. So before we decide what the patient requires, we need to have a, a, a consultation, um, which essentially we, we take a, a history and we examine your leg, uh, including looking at it with an ultrasound to find out where the problems are rising from. Because as Aaron mentioned, the, the bit you can see is the tip of the iceberg. It's the bit inside your leg, which is the most important part. If you don't get that bit right, then whatever you do to the bits that you can see won't work. And uh, having done that and figured out where the technical problem is, we, we then um, decide what the best surgical option is and whether or not we can do it under local anaesthetic, under local anaesthetic with a sedative, or whether in rare circumstances the patient needs a general anaesthetic for technical reasons or reasons of choice. But 95% of our patients have a local anaesthetic operation and effectively it's walk in, walk out. Most patients come in, uh, the operation itself takes around 25 to 30 minutes uh, and then they go through the recovery for a cup of tea and um, you know, very shortly afterwards, they're able to go home. So the whole thing usually for most patients coming in the door to going out the door takes about two hours. And this is a, um, an appearance, uh, you know, to show you the appearance of the pre-op on the left-hand side, and then the middle one is two weeks after surgery, and then the uh, one on the right is six weeks after surgery. Now, bear in mind that nobody, including me, ever shows you a bad slide of, of an appearance, okay? We, we, we always like to show our successes, and uh, you can see this is pretty successful. Um, it doesn't always look quite as perfect as that, uh, but generally speaking, we hope to get people, we certainly hope to make all the aching and throbbing and swelling go away, we almost all succeed. And, and from the cosmetic side of things, we like to think we can almost always will get people to be able to wear knee length garments in public without, without being self-conscious about it. We can't make you look like a marble statue, I'm afraid, or put you back on the catwalk but uh, we can usually get you to a point where you, you can, you can you know, go to the swimming pool and do all your normal activities without thinking everyone's staring at your legs. Um, I think that's about it from, from our uh, chat point of view. Uh, we're very happy to take any questions. I can see some people have already put questions up and Louise will moderate that and then we'll, Aaron and I will just take it in turns uh, to answer the questions for about uh, 15 or 20 minutes. So back to Louise now. Thank you, Eddie. Okay, let's go through the questions. Um, the first question is, how much do hormones and therefore pregnancy affect the formation of varicose veins? I've recently given birth. I am now suffering with painful veiny legs. Uh, I can answer that if, um, if you'd like. Um, Interestingly, uh, uh, ladies have a, an extra problem in that one of your hormones, uh, which is progesterone, uh, essentially uh, you get a spike just before a period and just before a baby comes out. And progesterone has many effects, but one of its effects is that it relaxes things to allow a baby to, uh, to appear. It also relaxes your veins. And that's why in the last trimester, um, you end up, if you have varicose veins, they become much larger and give you much more throbbing. And it can also lead to things such as uh, piles. But uh, part of the leg swelling that occurs in girls just before a period is due to progesterone. And it's made worse uh, by 
um, but, uh, if you have varicose vein. Nearly always, if you have varicose veins and you get pregnant, they become a little worse. They often become quite bad just before delivery and afterwards they improve a lot. They often go back to the way they were before, but uh, they can remain uh, quite large. Uh, but it is your hormones do play quite a major part and uh, blokes like myself get away with this uh, because we don't have uh, progesterone. Thank you. OK, um, next question. If after the ultrasound you find that veins are larger than they appear from the outside, would you suggest a general anaesthetic? Eddie, do you want to answer? Yeah, um, it, not usually. Um, the, the laser technique will uh, fix just about any diameter of the of a saphenous vein. The, the normal diameter of a saphenous vein is around about three to four millimetres. Um, and in really bad cases uh, of varicosities, it can be dilated up to 10 millimetres or even more sometimes. Um, but almost always that's treatable with the laser. There are very, very few circumstances where it isn't. Um, and almost always it can be done under local anaesthetic. Uh, the, the, the real difference, or the, the thing we adjust in our technique, if you have a really big vein, say nine, 10 millimeters, uh, we uh, pull the laser fiber back slower. Normally, uh, if it's a standard vein, which is five or six millimeters, we will withdraw the fiber around about uh, one centimeter every five seconds, which delivers around about 70 joules per centimetre of energy. But in a really big vein where we have to uh, burn it a little bit harder, we just pull it back slower and we might go up to 80, 90 or even 100 joules per centimetre in order to get the vein to close. Um, and that, that's one of the, I guess, the technical tricks uh, which allows us to do uh, um, effective operations with the laser on, on even really quite large veins. Thank you, okay. Next question, what are the benefits of varicose vein treatment at a hospital instead of a clinic? Aaron, do you want to go with this one? Um, I think you can indeed have, a, um, have your veins treated in a clinic. Many people do that. Uh, it's not an unreasonable thing to do. Uh, Eddie and I have uh, chosen not to do that. Uh, and our reason is really to do with complications. Uh, even, even it doesn't matter really how good you are, you always have complications. And if you only do a small number of procedures, then you won't encounter those complications uh, often. We do uh, many thousands of procedures a, a year. So even if we get one in a thousand major complications, that's actually uh, quite dramatic for us. Uh, and I always worry that if you're in a clinic on your own, not surrounded by uh, uh, other staff that can help you, that you're at a bit of a disadvantage. And it really only takes one disaster uh, for you to uh, realize you were in the wrong place. So we prefer uh, to operate out of a proper hospital. And indeed, uh, we operate in Benenden, but we also operate in central London. And indeed, we have shied away from doing treatments in a clinic. However, Plenty of people would have a different opinion uh, on that and think that their treatment in a clinic is entirely reasonable and safe. Um, so it's a, it's a personal preference. Uh, we prefer to do it in a hospital, um, which is totally sterile and with properly trained staff. Uh, and we feel much more comfortable. And it also lowers, you can deal with complications very quickly, and very effectively, and it leads to uh, happier patients. Uh, if you don't allow things to progress. Uh, so that's the reason we use hospitals. Uh, but as I say, other people have different opinions. So I, I wouldn't say it's bad to have your have treatment in a clinic. Uh, I just don't do that. Thank you. Okay. Um, can varicose vein, veins come back after treatment? And if so, are they as severe as the ones that have already been treated? Uh, well, yes, they can. Um, when we used to do the old operation, the high time strip, uh, the recurrence rate was about 30%, uh, at somewhere between two to five years. And quite often the veins came back in a very major way and needed uh, recurrent su substantial surgery, which got more and more technically difficult 
the harder it, the, the more recurrence there was. These days, uh, even with minimally invasive techniques, a recurrence can happen, um, but it's very much less common. It's around about 5% if you look at all comers. And all that 5%, um, most of those recurrences are not what we as surgeons would call true recurrences. In other words, it's not that the vein that was treated has come back again, it's that another vein in the, in the system has opened up. So from, from our point of view, as technicians, we would call that a second primary event. But from the patient's perspective, of course, it's a recurrence because you've had your veins operate on and they've come back again. Um, and to the point of how severe can the recurrence be? Well, most of the time, it's not terribly severe. Uh, it's usually fairly straightforward to fix. Uh, either with repeat lasering if it's if it's a new vein that's opened up um, or foam sclerotherapy. So the recurrences are both less frequent and less severe uh, with minimally invasive treatment than in, in, with the way that, that, that Aaron and I did it 20 years ago. Okay, thank you. So they're not zero. Yeah. Great, thank you. Okay, we have a question that, well, one lady is asked three questions. <laughs> so we will try and go through those, Aaron. Um, first is how likely is it to get a blood clot from varicose veins and what grade onwards give them more likeliness of that? That's the first phase of the question. Would you like to answer that now? or um, uh, I can answer that. Uh, your risk of a DVT uh, is much smaller than you might think. Uh, we do audit all our results uh, at Benenden and indeed elsewhere. And your risk of a DVT is about one in a thousand uh, with uh, EVLT. Uh, it's much higher than that with the older procedure, but one in a thousand is the risk. Uh, I would say that DVTs, which are a clot in the big vein in the leg, are very rare, but they occur in people who are not mobile after an operation. So you will find that me and Eddie constantly tell you that you have to be mobile and up and walking and if you're not up and walking you get in contact with us we get you back and wonder why you're uh, not walking it's nearly always to do with uh, discomfort and the commonest reason people aren't walking perfectly after the operation is because uh, I've put the bandage on a little bit too tight and it's uncomfortable so I just replace the bandage and everything gets back to normal so your DVT rate is about one in a thousand uh, which is pretty low uh, and to put that in perspective Having a baby has a risk of one in a hundred of a DVT. And if you broke your leg while skiing, your risk is about one in 10. So they're pretty high risks. And then to give you another uh, uh, bit of um, stats, your risk of a DVT when flying in an airplane is about one in a million, just in case you think it's any higher than that. Okay, thank you. Um, part, another part of their question is, can sliding down garment which wrinkles the skin can cause or worsen varicose veins? Uh, no is the answer to that. We, we don't really know why varicose veins occur. We know a valve breaks but we don't know why. Crossing your legs, uh, doing gymnastics, running too much or too little, being heavy or being skinny, none of those things make any difference. Mm. Uh, most of those are old wives tales uh, and I think we as surgeons usually tell people we don't know why they occur, whereas I think a lot of people like to give you a definitive answer that the reason you have varicose veins is because you are 16 stone. That's just not true. Sometimes if you're 16 stone and you have a varicose vein, your legs are achy, uh, but your legs are it, it, it might not be the varicose vein that's causing all the ache. But either way, being heavy doesn't necessarily cause you to have varicose veins. And if they say also, how many laser treatments do you need for each grade veins to solve the problem usually? And I understand that would be one. Well, session. yeah, normally uh, when we say uh, laser a vein, uh, what we mean is laser the veins. So sometimes you can have two veins and really very occasionally three veins that are not working in your leg. In which case we just thread the laser up each of those veins individually and uh, zap them. Uh, so one treatment uh, effectively is all of the veins done in, in one go. So it might take a little longer to do an extra vein, but most times it doesn't. Um, um, but we would treat 
the whole of your leg in one go. Thank you. Um, Paula says, does thread veins always develop into a much bigger and painful veins, Eddie? Yeah, um, not usually. Um, if you've just got isolated thread veins and there's no underlying valvular leak, then that doesn't predispose you towards developing varicose veins uh, at a later stage. Having said that, a lot of patients come with what they think are thread veins, and indeed are thread veins, but when we examine the leg and use the ultrasound scanner, uh, we see they've also got the varicose veins at the same time. Now, in that circumstance, the correct thing to do is to fix the varicose veins first. Because if you just do the thread veins with injection sclerotherapy, it won't work, or it will work for a very short period of time, then they'll come back again. Um, so the, the sort of order of batting, if you like, is to do the most severe bit first um, and then work down from there. But uh, there are many people who just have thread veins on, it's on their own, uh, which are no problem really, other than just the cosmetic appearance from the injection in clinic uh, and get them, get them to go away. And if you, if you have isolated thread veins, it doesn't mean that you're more likely to get varicose veins in the future, but the two things can occur at the same time. Okay, thank you. Um, an anonymous person says um, they have at least grade three to four veins, but only have occasional night cramps, no itching. Should they get them removed? Aaron? Uh, yeah, not necessarily there. Uh, so the absolute reason for getting uh, your veins treated is if your skin is damaged. Uh, ache and pain, probably there's no real urgency. So you shouldn't be frightened into having a vein operation just because of the grade, uh, whether it's two or three. If it gets to four, and that's this where the skin is, da is becoming damaged or changing color, we know that that will progress. And if you leave it alone, it just gets worse and worse. So when, uh, uh, if you came to us, we would tell you, you know, these are your options. Uh, uh, we always give you the option of leaving them alone and telling you what happens. Uh, but nothing really ever happens within a few months. So most people we would tell them, you know, we would advise you not to leave it for a few years. Uh, but if you itching and occasional night cramps is not something that we would say you have to have an operation. We might say to you, maybe wear a compression stocking uh, and see how that goes. I would say most people hate compression stockings. So it's really only a temporary uh, measure, but some people, uh, they are, absolutely against an operation which is entirely reasonable and a compression stocking can keep things at bay so just a bit of itch and a bit of night cramp is not enough for me to scare you into having an operation thank you okay um linda says her veins are not painful but they're very unsightly and are also on the shin as um per the diagram um she takes um sorry if i say this wrong river rock yeah. Um, does this cause a problem? Um, so Rivaroxaban's a in common parlance a blood thinner. We put patients on it for a variety of reasons. The commonest reason is a thing called atrial fibrillation, which is a, 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 a when your heart doesn't beat in a regular fashion. Um, and so most people are on it um, because of that. Uh, with regard to the veins, um, the threshold for surgery changes a bit depending on how severe they are. So as Aaron said, and I entirely agree with everything you said there, if it's grade three, so it's causing a bit of aching and discomfort and all the rest of it, then surgery is optional. Um, you can choose. You can either have surgery or you can wear stockings or you can leave them alone. And if you just choose to leave them alone, nothing awful will happen to you. you know, your leg will not fall off or anything like that. You, know, you, won't, you won't suddenly get... A major problem. So if it's if the veins are not causing skin damage then surgery is entirely your choice um, and we will provide it if you wish and we will tell you not to worry about it if you don't wish. Um, if you're on Rivaroxaban which is a blood thinner it complicates things a little bit uh, in the sense that you're more likely to, to bruise uh, more substantially after surgery. So depending on the reason why you're on the reverse band, 
usually we stop it for a couple of days beforehand, do the operation, and then you restart it afterward. There are some circumstances where people are on river oxaban because they've had, say, recurrent DVTs, and that might be a reason for leaving things alone. Uh, but on occasions, we, we do operate on patients who, who are on river oxaban, and we carry on, keep them on the river oxaban while we're doing it, um, because uh, the risk reward ratio is in favor of doing it that way, and it usually works out fine. But patients who are on blood thinners do get a bit more bruising than patients who aren't. Okay, thank you. Just got um, two more questions. Um, one lady says, I've had varicose veins stripped on both legs approximately 19 years ago. They've returned far worse on the right leg. Would I be suitable for laser treatment as you described? The stripping was awful. Um, the answer is uh, almost always we use a laser, but we would need to do an ultrasound first just to see uh, the lie of the land just underneath uh, the surface. Um, interestingly, uh, stripping veins, which shouldn't really occur anymore, uh, involves pulling the veins out. It's quite a dramatic uh, operation. But also afterwards, your body tries to heal itself. And in that process, it produces new veins. And those new veins don't, are not, uh, they don't have proper valves. And sometimes they can produce even more veins than you had uh, before you had your initial operation. So it doesn't really matter if the surgeon was a fabulous surgeon who did a perfect operation, your own body produces new um, uh, veins. And that's why often, after you've had uh, your veins stripped, you can get worse uh, veins occurring a year or, or, two, or two years afterwards. But to answer the question, sometimes the operation wasn't done perfectly. So what you thought you had was stripping of veins, but in fact, you didn't have that. You had just a, high, a tie of the vein up in the groin. And quite often we find that there are lots of areas that need to have a laser uh, placed in them just to uh, clear up what perhaps wasn't done uh, at the, in the beginning, but you do need an ultrasound done uh, first. Nearly always 20 years ago, and indeed when myself and Eddie were uh, junior doctors, uh, we didn't use the ultrasound machine. Uh, that was done by a radiologist. And so we really didn't, we were looking at the surface, more or less guessing uh, what vein was not working. Uh, and nowadays we have a, a, an ultrasound attached to us, rather like a stethoscope. And we spend most of our time looking underneath the surface just to see where everything is arising from. So quite often with recurrent veins, uh, there's a bit left underneath and we would treat that with a laser. But the bumpy bits on the surface, if they're loopy or uh, quite extensive, they often require a few small little incisions just to uh, break them up and get rid of them and make them look cosmetically okay. Lovely, thank you. One last question, it's quite a quick one. Um, from Victoria, how long um, does the recovery take? As in how soon can someone exercise after the treatment? For most people, um, the, you're, you're more or less back to normal within a couple of weeks. The, the most of the bruising and the discomforts in the first uh, week to 10 days, as a general principle, we, we put the bandage on uh, immediately after surgery and that stays on for about five days and whilst the bandage is a bit of a nuisance most patients find they don't have too much pain during that first five days because the bandage keeps everything compressed and under control and the worst bit is usually when the bandage comes off because that's when you start to feel tight usually down the inner side of the thigh and it, it feels a bit tight feels a bit sore it feels a little bit like you pull the hamstring and it takes about the same amount of time to get better. Um, so by the end of the first week, most people are back to doing all their normal household activities, driving a car, doing the shopping, doing the normal kind of things, but they're still a little bit tender and may need to take some mild painkillers or use some anti-inflammatory gel. Um, by day 10, things are starting to get better quite substantially. And then after that, every day, usually it is much, much better. So by the end of the second week, most people are back to light sports, going back to do light gym work, going for a jog, that kind of stuff. And usually by 
the end of the third week, most people have forgotten about it. They, they may still have a few bruises, but as far as the pain side of things is concerned, it's all gone back to normal. Now, there are some patients who get better very much quicker than that, and some patients who take a bit longer than that. Um, but by and large, 80% of the, of the patients that we treat, they have that sort of experience I've just described. 10% of people get better very, very quickly and wonder what all the fuss was about. And 10% of people come back to see us a couple of weeks later and say, well, it still hurts. So you said it was going to be better by now. Mm -hmm. uh, so, well, I'll just give it another week or two and it will be. Uh, and it all still is. So two weeks really to get back to uh, what most people regard as pretty much normal function. Okay. Well, thank you both very much for this informative chat this evening. I hope everyone um, listening and watching enjoyed it. And thank you for going through the questions. Um, we really appreciate it if you're listening, if you could do the survey at the end. Um, this helps us shape future events and helps us give feedback to a, a wonderful consultants online. Um, our next event is um, on cataracts um, relating to special lenses. It's with Damien Lake, our consultant ophthalmic surgeon, and Jane Steich, our eye unit sister. And that's on the 30th of March. Um, yes, so otherwise, thank you very much for everyone joining and taking your time out of your evenings. Um, thank you, Nadine Aaron, for your time. And thank you for my colleagues for supporting this evening. And um, I'll see you all soon. Thank you very much. Bye.